In times like these, it can be hard to think further than, you know, um, today. It can be harder to think further than the vacation that I want to take and maybe I don't get to take. It can be hard to think further than the next quarterly milestone, the next quarterly target I have to achieve because we feel under pressure, under siege from so many external influences. So how in all of that can we keep the big picture in mind? Uh, what is the big picture in the first place? How um, can we take advantage of the architecture of our brain? How does it maybe sometimes limit us if we don't pay attention to it? And how can coaching support with all of that? That and much more today on Ericsson Live with Dr. Marilyn Atkinson. All right, so welcome. Hang on, my levels are okay. Yes. Um, so welcome everybody to Ericsson Live. My name is Fabian Lutzig. Um, today we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Marilyn Atkinson, um, who is of course the founder of Ericsson Coaching International. Marilyn, as always, it's a big, big pleasure to have you here. Hey, I appreciate. It. Wonderful to be here with you, Fabian. Thank you. And for anybody who doesn't know Marilyn yet, let me read just a couple of the highlights of uh, what she brings to not just the streams, but to this world. Marilyn is the founder of Ericsson Coaching International and the originator of a well-known, comprehensive, solution-focused and outcome-oriented coaching model. Her model has actively contributed to the emergence and expansion of solution-focused psychology and the development of meta-program analysis for effective hiring and managerial approaches worldwide. As an industrial psychologist, she has honed solution-focused methods for multiple kinds of corporate engagements, making the tools effective and easy for managers to use. Marilyn has been a dedicated follower of Milton Erickson for decades and gave his name to Erickson Coaching International. Since founding Ericsson in 1980, she has developed many highly effective and specialized, not to mention fun, coach training programs. And they are taught all over the world. I think we're like over 115 by now, so, so really um, it, it's hard to find a place where, where we're not teaching these. Um, Marilyn has written and co-authored eight books, including The Art and Science of Coaching Trilogy, In the Dynamics of Coaching, Step-by-Step -Step Coaching and the Flow of Coaching, and of course, I would always be remiss not to mention my favorite, which is called Creating Transformational Metaphors, which I read basically every time when I prepare a course um, to get in the mood and to find stories that are just, yeah, really speak to people on a very direct subconscious level. So Marilyn, thank you so much for all of that. Thank you, Fabian. Yeah. So let's see where people are, are, are joining us from. That This is always one of my favorite parts of the stream. So everybody who is dialing into this, who is watching us, where are you joining us from? We usually have at least three or four different continents. So let's see if we can get up there again today. So just wherever you are, whether you're on LinkedIn, on Facebook, for Facebook or on YouTube, please let us know where you are joining us from. Um, and maybe let us know as well that um, on a scale of one to 10, how much are you able to access your big picture thinking right now? One being you're just beginning to slightly, you know, access it every once in a while and 10, no, I fully and completely can access my big picture thinking. Um, and we're on a first name basis. So where are you on that scale from <laughs> one to 10? And then hopefully we'll see maybe something has shifted by the end of this hour. Wouldn't that be nice? All right, so we're getting, uh, we're having Ella join us from Vancouver, Julie from Kazakhstan, Almaty uh, specifically in Kazakhstan. Leslie is joining us from Ontario, Canada. Ibrahim from Saudi Arabia. Agnieszka is joining us from Paris. Um, and the others are still coming on. Moy as well coming in from France. And then of course we have um, Vancouver from Maryland. Beautiful, beautiful Vancouver. And uh, also beautiful Nairobi uh, for myself. Um, 
and there's Derek from Toronto. Wonderful. Derek is a uh, is a student who who just completed module one. Very excited to have him here as well. Welcome, welcome, one and all. Um, whatever question you have for Marilyn around big picture thinking, please put them in the chat. Um, let us know what you're here for. Let us know what we can answer for you, what we can talk about for you, um, so that you get a boost, you get something that you need, you get something that um, that is feels useful to you. Okay, so Marilyn, um, we were chatting a little bit before the stream, talking about so what is big picture thinking and what do we want to talk about? How do we want to start this stream off? And as it, as we were talking about it, really, um, my mind went to the slogan that you have given to Ericsson Coaching International, the, the big mission, the vision of changing the world one conversation at a time. And um, I can't think of any bigger picture than changing the world. So let's just start there. Um, why is that important to you? Oh, well, you see, we human beings have a great deal of potential. And most of us don't use our potential very much. We get stuck in a grind. We get stuck in daily activities. And we are kind of on the wheel like a hamster doing those activities. So the time people take for their own development is far too small for really keeping that mastery ability that we have going. See, we all have the ability to be masters at what we do in multiple areas. And I'd, I'd love to talk about all those areas. But first, we have to put our attention on them. What we put our attention on, we create more of. And we need to ask questions about them. This is what coaching is all about. Curiosity about what's possible. Curiosity about uh, how we can grow a skill area or uh, a work area or a corporate initiative or even the whole team that we're working with. How can we become the initiators of big change? Because big change is genuinely what we need in this a new frontier we're facing right now in the world today. It is a new frontier. There's lots and lots of companies that are disappearing, um, others, uh, new ones that are rising. Uh, there's all sorts of things on the wheel of change right now. And 70% um, of the companies on the Fortune 1000 um, spectrum moment will be gone off that spectrum in the next uh, two to three years, say uh, some of the, says McKinsey. So that amount of change is unprecedented, Fabio. It's unprecedented. And uh, learning how to move and go beyond our limits is exactly what coaching is all about. Mm, yeah, so curiosity. Curiosity to me really does invite that image of striving towards that bigger picture, right? Not being content with the status quo and, and doing the same thing over and over. Um, because the world is changing around us. Um, and so so just repeating what you have done all this time um, it isn't going to help you grow and, and adapt. Change, as we know, or as we as we hold it, Ericsson, is inevitable. Um, and so, so we also um, will change. It's not even that we must change. We have to change. We, we will change. Um, the question is, are we going to take ownership and control of that, or are we just going to let it happen to us? Well, a comment I might make, which is to the audience here, how much of your human potential are you living and expanding right now? I bet you could scale it from one to 10. Where on the scale are you in terms of growing your human potential? And uh, immediately, just notice you get a number. Your unconscious mind, your inner knowing will give you a number. And then when you ask, 
you know, how can I move it even one point further? What areas of my life would I be putting attention on right now? What areas of my work? What areas of my interest? What areas of my enjoyment? Immediately, you're going to get visions. Hey, there's all sorts of things that I could be expanding my potential. And really, uh, you're going to be doing big picture thinking. Look at my hands. Because when we ask a big picture question, uh, we start to get visions of the future. We notice uh, directions we've been growing in. We notice how those directions might expand. And that is big picture thinking. Yeah, you, you mentioned the, the, the word vision quite a few times and, and getting these visions. Um, well, every once in a while, I, I meet people through corporate coaching programs or I meet people that, that I talk to outside of the realm of coaching. Um, and whenever I talk of visions, they, they let me know that visions? No, I don't have anything like that. Like if I, if I try to think about anything like that, it just comes up blank. So in terms of visions, in terms of, because th that is basically the bigger picture, right? That, that bigger picture manifests itself in, in a vision of, of what you want for yourself in the future. And so let's be really clear with, with visions, you, we don't mean hallucinations or anything like that. With vision, we mean a clear image of what I want my future to be like. The, the more clear, the more detailed, the better, the more powerful. And so what, how can we, or what, what small jump start might we give somebody that says, I, I just don't have visions. I'm just not a very vision type of person. Well, it's a, a great question because the word is definitely misunderstood. Uh, well, talk about vision we're not talking about something that you'd see in an omnimax theater you know you sit and the visions just play like a movie uh -uh -uh. our brain is organized so that we get flashes it might just be a flash a second long and it's it might not even have detail in it it might just be a fuzzy or even a vague picture of something that when we think about it, when that thought comes as a flash, uh, tugs at our heart. It might be uh, because, you know, our, our brain is always as if what we want. And it's as if being much more in terms of question. Why is this important to us? So that quick flash, which might just be a bright moment of uh, seeing a potential even uh, connected to a word like a value. So we don't actually see it. We see the brightness around it. Do you understand? There's no real picture there. But there's a and the brightness. And it comes quickly. Yeah, I'm so saying it's, this because it, for expectation management, has, right? So, so just, just to underline that, for expectation exactly, management, it's, it's not has, like you will have this, 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 um, this perfect crystal clear HD 4K picture of what's going on. And if you don't have that, then you're failing, then you're not a visionary type of person. Um, but, but it can be small flashes, these small intuitions, um, th that can be something that you can already work with and draw value from. So just kind of make sure that's understood. Truly, truly. Because uh, one, remember we've got two uh, major uh, cortexes here. The uh, cortex includes left hemisphere and right hemisphere. And the right hemisphere loves big picture thinking. If you ask a big picture inside, you know, what, would, what will I be really enjoying five years from now? What will be my heart's desire? What do I uh, look forward to the most? Uh, then immediately those questions start to stir up long range thinking, but also value thinking. We're always developing value and purpose in a visionary kind of way. This whole area of our thinking 
is all triggered by this um, part of ourselves that we hardly talk to. Most people, when they get visions, and, and we all do, of course, they're simple little flashes of what I'm going to do. And that's left hemisphere thinking. Now, both hemispheres use vision, but left hemisphere is extreme practical sameness, doing it again and again, um, just uh, making sure you've got things lined up and in order. And it uh, has a whole different function. And usually people spend their life in left hemisphere thinking. So it's vision, but it's not picture vision, which is the department of the right hemisphere. But the interesting thing, if I can talk about the brain for a moment, is that the right hemisphere is the leader. So if we start to ask questions of the right hemisphere, if we really ask, you know, these questions about our our own development and our real big picture for our life, our potential, and how to unfold that, guess what? It starts to inform left hemisphere with all ideas, and there's a, often a tipping point that happens when suddenly the whole left hemisphere realigns because it can see the doability of those visions. It's getting the ability and the mastery focus together that turns us into a leader, and that's what coaching is all about in the corporation. Yeah, speaking of that, uh, I, I work a lot with with accomplished senior managers who are in some sort of leadership development program on the fast track to become a partner. Um, so they are very much in this mindset of I have to prove myself, right? So I often catch them or see them very much being in left hemisphere thinking because to a certain degree, that's what brought them there. That, that's what made them successful because that's the incentives that the system that they're in give them, right? Because a lot of the structures that we build up as society and corporation and so on, they, they don't necessarily encourage right hemisphere type of thinking. And so that's a big challenge of, of daring them to step out into this different kind of thinking. And, and you were, you were saying before, um, asking these questions and, and, and wondering, bringing out this curiosity, that's often a big challenge for, for clients that I work with because they are now stepping into a mindset of, I have to know it all. And a question that they don't know the answer to scares them. <laughs> that, that concept of, I'm going to ask a question in order to invite answers in and in order to, to focus my awareness, is something that is completely alien to them. It's if I ask a question, I have to know the answer. So, so that's that's something ah. th that I'm curious. Like, what, what, how can we support that in others and in ourselves to, to be comfortable with just asking a question and then waiting for the answers rather than having to have one right away. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that type of thinking <laughs> comes from our history. It comes from the fact that our cultures generally, for thousands of years, focus more on just getting things right, uh, being okay, survival. We focused on survival. That was our, our nature as human beings. But the deeper, wider, bigger nature of being human is our potential. And we've got this enormous brain with a, you know, it's got a hundred billion uh, neurons. I mean, it's un un unbelievable, unbelievable in terms of our capacity to create linkages. And, and uh, we do that by asking big questions. And suddenly we're growing about two miles, if you understand, actually two miles of neuron in the brain. We have neuroplasticity with our brain. It means that uh, as we coaches work with leaders and we're assisting them to reinvent the nature of work so that 
you know, they're really seeing uh, new initiatives, new potentials in the company, building their teams strongly, getting the love of work back in there. Because you're talking about people don't love their work. Their work creates stress. We're building with coaching, with Erickson coaching, we're building the love of work again. Because uh, we're reinventing our even as we work and that develops our companies that gives vigor and uh, value energy to everybody around us i'm so glad that you're saying that because that line of argument often is shut down as some millennial thing you know ah that's the millennials they don't know how to work <laughs> they can't put an honest day's work into it like the, the 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 generation of my parents if work doesn't hurt you're doing something wrong Right? It's not worth anything if it's not kind of painful or stressful or something like that. So just to, to make it even clearer, why is that actually good business sense to have people invested in their work rather than actively disengaged? Yeah, yeah. Well, however, our parents did have a really important idea. And that meant that you need to finish what you start. You need to be committed to getting results, not just getting big ideas. And I want to say to you right now that big picture thinking includes starting something well. All This is what we're doing in coaching. We're training people to how to start an initiative well, how to plan it well, how to do all the strategic thinking involved in that. This is really important. How to then make sure that we complete Every strand of that, make it work on all the levels, including all the different kinds of customers, including all the different qualities that bring us to the top of our game and our companies to the top of their frameworks that they're invested in. This is, this is the heart of coaching. It's a both and game. You know, how to hired and then how to take that inspiration into results. And that's that's the true, true aspect of big picture thinking. We're looking in both directions at the same time. Yeah, very true. Um, coaching is always related to action, right? Good coaching always results in action steps, in momentum. And that, that is something that sometimes I feel is a little underappreciated. Uh, the self-introspective aspect is my, maybe sometimes a little overemphasized and it's it's important it's important to know to, to align um, your vision your values and everything but if you don't translate it into action then nothing's actually going to change um, so big picture includes right what what is so your contribution our, yeah so in our art and science of coaching program we focus on every one of these aspects separately in four modules the first module is about inspiration, and it's how to act, tune your brain and your abilities so you in, in create inspired potential and inspired results in the people you're coaching so that they get back in touch with their vision. But then the second module is all about implementation, how you can uh, turn that into effective results relevant results and uh, how that can also be an inspirational focus and then of course the third module is integrating that together in terms of people and purpose and uh, value and working in the whole corporate development frame and uh, it's a, uh, a linkage framework which uh, allows then completion of each project to be really strong and that's what turns companies into front runners that's what turns people in the company into uh, evangelists for that company strong proponents and uh, for the company to stand for the communities in the world because as we're building this kind of thinking it moves beyond our corporate private results it moves into community results, and it moves into uh, wanting to make a difference, really make a difference to the world. Yeah. 
So since we're speaking about the art and science of coaching, um, to everybody who's here, um, I, I know very often we get people who are alumni of Ericsson's actually. So if you have taken the art and science of coaching, even if it's just one module, what has changed for you in terms of big picture thinking through learning how to coach people or much rather in, in learning or in, in becoming a coach in stepping into this kind of thinking obviously also what happens in the art and science of coaching is not just that we go through the, se the theory but large part of it is dedicated to practical application and so people coach other people but they also spend a lot of time as coaches and getting coached so to kind of feel the power of what it is that they want to be doing on their own mind and body um and uh, so, so I'm curious if if you are here and and you have taken the art and science of coaching, what are some of your experience? How has your outlook um, on your life or on the people around you changed? And so there's a bit of delay between uh, what we say and what people hear. So while people are typing in their answer, um, I think Marilyn, what you're saying is especially relevant with building the community and having this drive, this passion, being evangelists for the company. I think that has always been relevant, but it has now come into the focus all the more in times of COVID and in term, in times of remote working becoming much more prevalent because now you don't have the luxury as a manager and as a leader to say, well, I'm just going to control that their butt is in their seats and that means they're working because they're clocked in, right? They are remote. I don't, I can't open the door and look in and to see if they're working. So. I need to build something much more compelling than I'm going to look over your shoulder. Um, so, so what might there be in terms of remote working, post-COVID world that, you know, big picture thinking can bring to this? Well, first of all, it, it creates what I call internal reference. So as soon as we're working from home, we need a vision that's a strong one of what we're going to create and uh, some great work by Harvard about 10 years ago was uh, a study of how people have a great day so they asked about uh, 5,000 leaders managers and uh, workers uh, to remember the best day of work in the last three months and uh, what was very interesting, and this is something we've used a lot in the art and science of coaching, is that uh, when people remembered that, they didn't remember some boss telling them, you know, you won this award because you were so strong and da 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 da. They don't even remember their colleagues giving appreciation. They don't remember a day they got a raise. Money was very low on the score of what created a great. What? Well, I'll ask you right now before I give you the answer what they discovered way above the rest. Mm. What for you was your best day of work in the last three months? And I, I, I bet it had nothing to do with where you were located. What do you remember, True. Fabian? True. I mean, today is very, very strong in my mind where I was wrapping up a course for United Nation, for the United Nations on emotional resilience and just getting all the feedback of how the last six weeks, eight weeks actually have impacted people's lives. So actually, I think for me, making a difference, a feeling of significance, I think that plays into it very, very strongly for me. Okay. Well, you're right on with what respect on uh, eight tenths of the people who ask themselves that question got as well and that is our best day of work is when we're making significant progress a project that we're involved in and engaged in so human beings love to uh, genuinely produce a result that they're proud of and they love to have the experience that they're making progress on that and they've taken some real steps or they've got creative ideas that or even just uh, they're moving well with what they know. It doesn't matter. But we're, when we're really making progress, that's a great day at work. And our location doesn't matter. But what does matter is that we're invested in that work. And that's where 
the art and science of coaching makes such a difference or team coaching or just the ability of a manager, a coaching style leader to someone who has coaching competencies as a leader to uh, assist his team to get invested. What's our mission? What's our vision? Where are we? Why is this important to us? What, will, what difference will it make? And as people build the connection between vision and the action steps, they start to move beyond the blockers and get those more of those days, a lot more of those days, where they can say, I love my work. And that's truly the function of coaching. It allows people to connect vision and value with doable steps and do it for themselves, not have someone else tell them from the top down. And thus, we become the initiators, the real initiators of all that uh, inner progress as well as outer progress. Yeah. What you're saying resonates a lot with me. I, I have spent quite a bit of my, my pre-coaching career also looking into the factors of what, what makes people really engage at work. And again, money isn't unimportant, but it comes in at sixth, seventh place, something like that in, in, in the studies that I've seen. Um, and other factors are things like ownership. How much do I really feel like I, I am an actor at work and not just kind of being driven by other people um, and that, that ties in with what you're saying right if I if I have ownership then I can actually make progress on things if I'm caught in red tape or you know bureaucracy or that sort of thing then that really takes the fun out of it and and, and, and the effectiveness um, and what I found a lot is simply being treated like an adult makes a big big difference having a certain modicum of trust by leadership um, and then wanting to repay that trust can be a big motivating factor. Um, Beautifully said. Thank you. <laughs> Hard-earned lesson. Um, uh, Leslie is is chiming in and saying, uh, don't underestimate that people are quite capable of tapping into vision as long as we create a strong experience in coaching. Not, not quite sure what that is exactly in relation to. I know, as I said, there's always a bit of a delay. Um, but that is definitely true. And I, I, yeah, don't underestimate people as companies. I think don't underestimate your own people is, is a big, big lesson right. that f from the last year as well, because people have adapted um, so significantly. People are visionaries, even if they don't think they are. We're, just look at your dreams. You dream at night. Uh, our whole brain is designed. And it may be just quick flashes. That those visions count, and our open-ended questions, our uh, curiosity about how they're going to find mastery, and how they're going to go beyond their limits. Uh, what we put our attention on, we get more of. And coaching works. Suddenly, people find themselves developing again. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah, um, and Moy um, added, "I love." And then put a heart. I love, love what you said. I am inspired. So, um, did, did, yeah, it looks like we're living up to changing the world one conversation at a time right now. That's nice. Um, and then, um, Ella, in the in, in in answer to the question of how has your big picture thinking maybe engaged or changed um, uh, through attending the art and science of coaching, she's saying the following. Being more effective in challenge and situations through activating that right hemisphere of my brain, seeing them more as an opportunity to grow. So that's a really nice and big one. So keep it coming. If you are here and you have already taken part or all of the art and science of coaching, let us know how has that impacted, enabled, transformed your big picture thinking. And if you haven't done the art and science of coaching yet, how would you like it to change your big picture thinking? What would you need to get out of a coaching program so that it gives you exactly what you need? Let us know because we're really, really, as Marilyn keeps keeps mentioning, curious. We're holding that space of curiosity for what it is that you need and what we can give you. Um, yeah. Uh, 
may I add something here? Please, please, absolutely. Uh, please, Fabian. Which is that I think what defines works in coaching is different from the other coaching schools is the whole focus is on mastery and how people become masterful and fulfill their potential and go beyond their limits. And that includes and in fact is based on big picture thinking. So we're uh, we are the school that assists people to develop this cr uh, connection across the corpus callosum between the left hemisphere and right and really open up and be, be uh, in charge of the energy we get as leaders uh, doing that kind of linkage. So that is the heart and science of, uh, of what Milton Erickson uh was all about his art and science was uh, very very much about connecting uh, people to their vision uh, it's a unique and very very important part of being human and by the way in the art and science of coaching we go into vision not just one way we go into there's about six different areas of developing vision that are really really relevant and people can develop them uh, and surprise them. So. so what I just get drawn to, because it's so powerful, as, as you talk about Milton Erickson, is um, the the way that, and you were talking about taking charge, right? So so the way that leaders can take charge of and, and leverage the way that our brain is structured, leverage those mirror neurons and show up in a certain way that then spreads and, and jumps over to the people that I am inspiring. And it's inspire means literally to breathe into somebody, right? So I can inspire a certain mood, a certain vision, a certain attitude by living it, by embodying it. Um, and I, I just always get drawn to the story of Milton and George because it's so powerful. So anybody who has heard it, it's also, of course, it's also here. Um, Anybody who has heard it, it's it's just so, so powerful. And it just speaks to how, at what a fundamental human level we are engineered to be social, to mirror each other, and to understand each other beyond words. Um, so I, I don't know if you want to if you want to tell it or if it if it's maybe too long of a thing. And I, I, I'll leave that I'll leave that to you because it's quite a quite a work of art to tell that story in its entirety okay well uh when we have five minutes at the end give me a cue and all that got story. it i'll be happy to yes absolutely but you were you were leading up to these six different kinds of ways of of intelligence of of building vision so now of course we want to know what are they <laughs> <laughs> well you know way back in the 80s uh, Gardner talked about eight kinds of intelligence, uh, visual, spatial, and linguistic, and interpersonal, and uh, mathematical, and musical, you know, there's all the range, bodily, kinesthetic, uh, natural intelligence, going into the forest. So there's lots and lots of sort of ideas of intelligence. But what we're developing is different ways to work with uh, seeing and hearing and feeling each other. So one kind of vision has to do with uh, looking out of our eyes and just seeing the world around us uh, in terms of here I am and this is what I'm creating and we can see this result and that possibility and so on. But another kind of vision, a very important one, is what we call coach position vision, which means look not only at the steps and the areas and how we got to where we are, but we also look at uh, the future the same way. We build forward, and we're, we can do this with our clients. Now, beyond that, we we'll also looking at this on different levels, like we can look at who are they becoming through time and how are they building different kind of strategies and how do those strategies build through time. And we're looking at how they 
are developing their connection to others, their relational uh, skills through time. And we're looking at uh, their happiness. We can look at happiness and productivity, happiness, productivity through time. And uh, we can look at learning productivity through time. I mean, there's all sorts of key areas where we can take this overview position. But beyond all that, we can also uh, do the kind of thinking where we step into someone else's shoes and look from their point of view. And the essence of empathy involves being able to take this kind of second position and stepping in and understanding as if we could uh, really see, hear, feel what it's like to be that other human being. And then there's other, mo even more interesting kinds of uh, vision, uh, ways in which we can uh, look at, uh, at the as if the world has a vision ways in which we can step into larger thinking as if we were the whole human race having a vision as if we could be all of us and experience our aim as the whole and just relax into that relax that deeper knowledge and from that place of wholeness Notice what bubbles up in terms of way back in our personal life. How does that affect every area that we're now personally involved with? Now, I'm just naming some of them here. Uh, some of you may be musical visionaries like Mozart. You know, some of you may be uh, kinesthetic visionaries like uh, the... Kala Harry Bushman. You know, there's all sorts of amazing visioning abilities that people have developed. Yeah, I love that. I love that picture of bubbling up something that kind of has been there in the depths and, and just through this, you know, unexplainable for like through this kind of just un unresistible force is, uh, is is kind of just being driven to to come to to light. Um, really really nice really inspiring so all of that is making it honestly a little hard for me to concentrate right now because obviously anytime you ask an as if question honestly you, every time you you ask an open ended question it's creating an open loop that the mind wants to fill so my mind is like going all these different directions now and taking the big picture thinking <laughs> rather than being in the tactical side here right now so that is really really powerful that even when you try to take yourself out of it it still calls to you right which is why coaching is so powerful not just in the 30 minutes that you have a coaching session but for several days after a lot of a lot of insights in coaching actually come under the shower three days later when you don't even expect it well you're just speaking to what's really practical about this as soon as we link into these bigger frameworks then in the shower you do get the practical ideas you want. And you also get uh, the relational ideas, the leadership ideas, where you really do take second position with someone else and know what they need. Or you do uh, notice the learning that needs to be learned for this team to become much stronger in whatever they're doing, and so on. So the leadership skills really, really grow through going beyond our limits in the most uh, personal way. Yeah, and so the, the limits, I'm, I'm, in, I'm interested to exploring a little more um, the, the hardware that we're working on, right, has been developed millions of years ago and developed for very different incentives and very different priorities than, than we're living in right now. And everything that you just described allows us to be in a frame of mind that is useful to us where we are in charge of the way we perceive the world and, and rather than being driven by those a little more ancient parts of our mind that still want the best for us 
but express it in a way that might be counterproductive if my boss is yelling at me and I get into fight, flight, or freeze, for example. So I think the term monkey brain is kind of in popular science, I think, like fairly, fairly common. So could you tell us a little bit about that monkey brain and how, um, how what you described before with the different types of vision, how that can help not overcome it, but kind of help it relax and let the other parts of the brain that are more solution focused, more constructive do its work. Well, you're describing what we call the old emotional system, the limbic system and the brainstem. And the brainstem, of course, is that part of our uh, whole physical brain, because physical brain that gets us out of danger quickly. And the monkey brain, you know, survived. All our ancestors survived. We're here because we developed our fast stress response to danger. Now, that's really important that we've got it. But we humans, of course, linked everything to language. So uh, our left hemisphere in particular, it turns an old stress message and starts to repeat it uh, because it ties to the emotional system Oh, it's happening now. The emotional system, soundness system. So we come into the same location where somebody chewed us out, and boom, what comes up is that conversation. So nowness tends to uh, work wonderfully for animals. You know, um, two ducks have a, a interaction on the pond, and rah, they're fighting, and they flap their wings. But 30 seconds later, you know, they do a little shake and off they go in different directions and they never think about it again. So we've got this system designed for repeating things. Oh, it might happen again. What if it's this? And that creates this physical, uh, emotional response. Now, what coaching does, is assist people to move beyond that old style of thinking by understanding, first of all, how it works. You recognize it. Oh, here it comes again, those internal dialogue messages. And then you is you notice what is really important. There's all sorts of ways you can quickly, through vision, link back to your priority. Now, this gives you energy. It stops the old habits. Uh, the, for example, um, bad habits, uh, eating too much, smoking too much, uh, all the whatever too much is. Uh, the way in which you might uh, reduce your stress by going on a shopping binge and you buy things you don't want. And all the things people do that waste their time and energy just go away because what you've got your attention on is what you love. As soon as we notice we love it and we can start to really build vision in varieties of ways and see how we can contribute it, notice how it's important to us, uh, we move beyond those old fears that you know keep us back in the uh, emotional zone, you know, fear of upsetting people, fear of making mistakes, the fear of, uh, uh, you know, even the fear of vision, for heaven's sake. Like, I better not think too strongly or, you know, somebody's going to get mad at me because <clears throat> I'm not just doing my job. <sighs> Throw it away because human beings are designed. Our brain, our brain, first of all, was very visionary. That's what got us to be up to the level where we created language. And the developed language we have is only 200,000 years old. That's a minuscule amount of time. And in that time, we created wonderful new abilities, but we also created the idea of negative thinking. And that's what has got us stuck for about the last 10,000 years. So that we're uh, still learning how to regain vision again when we need it. 
coaching has a very important function, incredibly important function, which is to give people back their human potential again. And that's what we're doing. As you move beyond your limits, you're re-engaging uh, all this cross-functional, right-left hemisphere thinking that is your heritage, that is your actual ability system. And it's natural. It is who you are. And the old habits of our cultures that kept us imprisoned in stress zones for the last 10,000 years fall away and we get regain our human potential again. Mm, wow. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I can't like if, if you're watching this and you're hearing this kind of thing for the first time, I, I cannot impress on you how powerful that is when you really internalize that, when you have seen it in action, when you help other people work with that. Um, it always brings up so many things that y you don't even know before you like it, it's just unfathomable how um, um, yeah um, if, what it brings up like the beautiful beautiful thing about coaching is that you ask so many questions and you have no idea what the client is going to say right because you are tapping into that potential and the client also doesn't know what they're going to say um, and I have found that there is a bit of a learning curve for clients to let themselves be led in that dance a little bit and kind of relax into this, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. And of course, the coach has to learn that. That's what the art and science of coaching is for. But then also the client um, needs to be ready for that. Um, and, and that can be something that, uh, yeah, that, that takes a couple of, of instances of, uh, of asking these kinds of questions and tapping into that. Mm. So before we... Well, the art Sorry. and science of coaching is really important here. Can I just say something yeah, about that? Because people need to practice this. See, the key element is, first of all, learning some of the critical tools and methodologies that are designed to take you beyond your limits. And then practicing them with others in a, a small team over the, the art and science of coaching takes about six months. So you start to get really skilled, and then, ah, then comes the ability that you can actually create that with others. But first, you have to sort of turn the Queen Mary. Uh, Queen Mary is a, uh, a, a huge cruise liner that, uh, if it's going in one direction a long time, has built a lot of uh, directional impulse, and that's what a lot of our negative emotions have done our old stories to ourselves and our regrets and our uh, victimhoods and our different kinds of uh, um, blame and shame and all these story built emotions. They're not our real emotions, they're built from stories. And uh, so what we do in the art and science of coaching is just simply move beyond that start to rebuild your capabilities and as you practice those capabilities get stronger and stronger because we have neuroplasticity what the brain puts attention on gets to develop the newest and most important aspects of your capabilities and the others don't go away they're still there if you go back to them but you can build now a whole new uh, ability system. Yeah, you can in fact teach an old dog new tricks because of neuroplasticity, as we have exactly. found out only in the last decade. Um, so that's that's pretty new uh, kind of information. So before we hear about Milton and George, I want to read out some more comments that that our our audience has uh, has um, shared with us. So Gwen says, "Wow, this is powerful." The leader assisting his slash her team making connections between visions and actions and making significant progress together. Yeah, definitely. Jane is sharing. The bigger picture helps create more meaning to me, help understand and connect diverse things and how they relate to the ultimate vision. Um, if it says coaching for regaining vision to move beyond limits, 
to regain our human potential. So it's kind of like, um, yeah, picking out what's what's kind of most resonating with her there. And Moy, I, I love this picture. Moy is saying, feel so lucky to hear that I am vibrating of happiness. And uh, yeah, so that that is uh, something wonderful. Um, so Marilyn, we have about five minutes left. Would you would you honor us and regale <laughs> us with with one of my favorite stories of all time? Okay. Well, uh, it's a a lovely story because it gives you an experience of Milton. Milton is a young man. He's uh, you you've got to understand his history. 15 years old, he had polio, completely uh, destroyed his ability to walk, to move, to even move anything but his eyeballs. Can you imagine waking up and only can move your eyeballs after a three-day illness? And uh, he was put in an iron lung. Uh, they didn't know what to do with him. They just let him lie there in his mother's kitchen. And he regained the ability to use his whole brain. He actually rebuilt, is what the doctors say, different nervous system ability through envisioning himself do what is, doing what his baby sister did. She would raise her head and lower it. She was just uh, three weeks old. And he would imagine, see himself raising his head and lowering, raising his head and lowering. Now, he started this because he started to get movement, and then he continued it. He just practiced and practiced, and he kept envisioning himself with different skills and different abilities until two years later, he was walking again. Now, that was what we call microvision. He was envisioning the micro movements, but it built his whole capacity to imagine in all sorts of other ways. So picture uh, 10 years later, Milton is now graduated as a psychiatrist and he has his first mission in a very backwoods health center where they parked a lot of people who had different kinds of uh, mental illness of the time in those days, they had no drugs. They just parked people in big buildings and left them there, frankly, to rot. Nobody knew what to do with them. So he's walking through wards of this hospital, eight wards given to him. And on the eighth ward, in the back ward, he finds George. Now, George is a guy who sat on a bench and didn't talk to anybody, didn't move do anything day after day except when a new person came into the hospital or came into the ward and then he'd jump up and he'd speak word sound to that person really close to them in their face now what's word sound I, I mean I ask you well it's a developed skill to just mix all sorts of words together in a, a funny way that doesn't make any sense at all, but sounds like conversation. Now, Milton listened to this as a skill. Wow, he was fascinating. And the next day he got his secretary and got her to take down in uh, uh, shorthand that word salad that George was speaking. Then he went to his office and built himself some word sound. Different, but still conversational. So when he was ready, about a week later, he went back to George's ward. Uh, he practiced for a while. George jumped up and spoke word salad to him. <laughs> Milton listened, nodded, and then he spoke word salad right back to George. Ha! Huh! George was astounded. George just looked at him, eyes ablaze. And then he walked over to his stool and sat down. And he just stared at Milton. And Milton sat on another stool. And George 
waited a little while, he took some deep breaths, and then he stood up and he spoke angrily to me. And he said, I read that bulletin about Mona. And he started to really uh, tell Milton about how angry he felt in word sound. And Milton stood up and nodded and listened to George speak in his upset. When George was done, Milton waited a moment or two. He spoke not anger, but intensely in word salad. And a run of a da 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 blah. And a no 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 And he spoke just as intensely. George was impressed. He nodded. They were having quite a conversation. sat on his stool and Milton sat on his stool and they looked at each other. And now George got up again. Trust was building. And so he spoke to Milton from the heart. He told Milton the word self, how much it hurt. He told Milton his sadness and his grief and his m- mis knowing of his life. He told Milton deep things he hardly knew about what was truly important to him. And he spoke totally in words. And Milton listened. And Milton finally stood up and he spoke from the heart back to George. He spoke hard in the same tones, in the same warm and way. He spoke like a friend. He spoke like a wise elder. He spoke to George in George's language. George listened. Finally, George stood up again, and he said, Speak sense, doctor, in English. And Milton said, I will, George. Tell me your last name. They found George on a road, and nobody even knew his last name. And George said his last name and said a few words of word salad. And Milton repeated his last name and said, where are you from? And pretty soon, Milton got George's whole history. And they were talking in English again. Now that was the beginning of George coming back into the world. And it took another year, but George built his life again. He had inherited a farm. He moved back to that. And for the next 40 years, he stayed in touch with with, uh, Milton with postcards. And every single postcard had a few signs of what he was doing. He lived alone, you know, built a new roof on the barn. And he'd always end with a few words of words. I've seen these postcards. They're wonderful. Everybody, Milton understood vision. And Ericksonian coaching is about bringing that back into the life of all of us on this planet. And so we move out of our word salad of recrimination and self-talk and stuff of nonsense that we talk to ourselves again and again with. And back to the heart, back to the connection to our life and to our loop deep love of being human. Wow. Thank you so much, Marilyn, for sharing that. That is, uh, yeah, one of the most meaningful stories that I've ever heard and, and one that, that I aspire to kind of carry forward and, and to embody in 
um, showing up like that for other people in holding them as okay holding them as whole um, and speaking their language meeting them where they're at so that they can develop that potential for themselves and um, yeah um, be all they're meant to be be all that they want to be um, so I just yeah thank you so much for sharing that with us Whew. Um, just kind of have to get out of that. It's, it's really difficult. Um, Marilyn, thank you so much. Um, this has been amazing and inspiring as always. Um, we don't want to intrude on your time any longer. But so there's more stories like this in, in, in this book. And I, honestly, nobody's paying me to kind of promote this book. This is just because I really, really like it. Um, I, I think it's a crime that there's no audiobook version of this. If you ever need somebody to voice and to speak kind of this audiobook, let me, you have my number, let me know. I would be honored. Um, so apart from Seamus... Oh, you're hired. Uh, yeah, great. And so, so you would you would tell the stories in your own voice, uh, in your own words, and I would just read the bits between. Um, anyway, apart from that, um, I think uh, this has been... Um, yeah, so so much connectivity. I mean, we're in other other parts of the world. I feel like I'm in the same room with you. I feel like I'm in the same room with with everybody that's joining us. So, Moy, Nela, Ella, um, Ifet, Sherry, Jane, Gwen. Thank you so much for being here. Um, if you have any questions, um, it was a pleasure, Fabian. Thank you. Yeah, put them in the chat, and we can get them answered uh, at least uh, in a written way. Um, Julie is ask is 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 uh, adding how wonderful Marilyn. Thank you so much for sharing that story on George and Milton. How beautiful and powerful. Um, so with that, I think it's a great place to come to a close for today. Um, we do this pretty much every week. Uh, join us next week for Ericsson Live for a wonderful panel of four professionally certified coaches. Um, and Marilyn, I'll leave you with the last word. What is it that you want to uh, leave with people as we end for today? Oh. Uh, enjoy vision. This week, take some time for it. Enjoy expanding your potential and going beyond your limits. And uh, enjoy big picture thinking. Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure to be here. Okay. Okay.